So section 5.1 is probably not what you were expecting when it comes to like starting a unit on probability. It wasn't much in terms of calculations and like traditional probability stuff. It's more just about conceptual designing a simulation, using long run to help you out, etc. Starting in section 5.2 and also in 5.3, we're getting to a lot more of those traditional probability calculations because it's really important that you can handle the basics when it comes to analyzing more complicated statistics situations. So this is the beginning of that, and we're talking about some big probability rules and some vocabulary as well. First off, um, vocab term that you probably heard from me in Algebra 2, the sample space is the list of all possible outcomes. Outcomes being something that can happen. And the variable we use for the sample space is a capital S, but we'll put a lot of times like these little fancy, I don't even know what you would call that, on the edges of the S. So you would say like the sample space is, and when you're making a list, you do squiggly brackets. So if I was going to roll a die, the numbers one through six would be my only possibilities. If I was going to flip a coin, my sample space would be heads and tails. If I was going to pick somebody out of my class, the list of your names would be my sample space. The sample space is just everything that can happen. Okay. A probability model is going to be a very useful thing to us here. It contains two things. Whenever you have a probability model, you're going to have a list of all outcomes. So basically, you're going to have your sample space, everything that can happen, and then you're going to have the probability for each outcome, the probability for each thing that occurs. So if I was going to design a very basic probability distribution, um, a lot of times you'll see these as tables right here. I could have a coin example where I have heads and I have tails, and then I have probability is a half, probability is a half. So I'd have like probability, and I'd have like the thing, the events. Speaking of, the last vocab word on this page is called an event. And an event is the a subset of the sample space. What do I mean by subset of the sample space? It's inside the sample space, but it's a smaller part of it. So it's like just a collection of outcomes um, that are all in S. So collection of outcomes in S. So on my rolling a die example, I could look at the event getting a four or higher, or I could look at getting an odd number, or I could look at, um, I don't know, a prime number or something like that. If I was going to pick somebody in class at random, I could look at the probability you have glass, the event of you wearing glasses, or you being at least 5'5", five five, or something like that. So an event is just basically whatever you want it to be. You just define a collection of things that you're interested in finding the probability of. Usually when we establish an event, it's because we want to know its probability. So there's a little bit of vocab for you all. Um, and then what we're going to do right here is look at a basic example using sample space to arrive at a probability model or probability distribution. So we're going to picture flipping a fair coin three times. And we want to describe the probability model, which means all the possibilities and the probability for each. So in a problem like this, that's not that big in scale, the best thing to do is just write out all the possibilities. So I'm going to picture if I'm going to flip three coins, it could be where they go heads, 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 just like that. And I'm just going to write out all the possibilities here, trying to be somewhat systematic with it. I can go heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. Um, and then I need tails, heads, heads. So that's all the ones with two. And then I could have one head. So I could have HTT. I could have THT. I could have TTH, TTT. So this is a list of all of the possibilities. Incidentally, thinking about like um, algebra two, when we look at the number of possibilities total, we had two choices for the first one, two for the second one, 
and two for the third one, there should be eight possible outcomes altogether. So I have all the possibilities here. This is what can happen when you flip three coins. They say to describe the probability model for this chance process and use it to find the probability of getting at least one head in three flips. So what we care about in this problem is the coin landing on heads. We want to get at least one of those. So if I'm going to make a probability model, those are generally written as tables. And we're going to care about two things when we make our table. We care about how many coins land on heads. And we care about the probability of that happening. So the least number of coins landing on heads we can get is zero. Or we could have one on heads. Or we could have two. Or we could have three. And that's all the possibilities. Getting zero coins landing on heads is only possible one time. One right there. And for probability, you just take it out of the total. There are eight possibilities that are all equally likely. So the probability of getting one, sorry, no coins landing on heads is one out of eight. Next up, I'll go for one coin landing on heads. That's going to be these three options right here. So this is a three out of eight. Two coins landing on heads is these ones right here. That's a three out of eight. And then the last one, all three landing on heads is a one out of eight. So they ask us, find the probability of getting at least one head in three flips. At least one head could be this, or it could be this, or it could be this. Basically, it's just not that one. And if I look at my options, all those circled, nope, not all the circled guys, all these circled guys have at least one heads. So the answer to the problem we care about is seven out of the eight possibilities here. Okay, so if you make a list of everything that can happen, it makes probability questions not that bad to analyze. So let's go ahead and make a little list right here of just basic probability rules, some of which you guys have already heard. Our first rule is something we've already talked about in the last set of slides. For any event A, Usually with events, and again, an event is just whatever you want it to be. We use a capital letter to represent it. The probability of an event is always between 0 and 1. And we'll use this notation, P of, and then you write down your event right here. So the probability of A is between 0 and 1. In other words, you can't have a probability of 2 or of negative 7 or something like that. Okay. If S is the sample space... The probability of everything in your sample space, so the probability of S occurring, is 1. So basically, if you're going to have a sample space, it has to be the probability of 1. It's everything that is possible in the problem. So third rule, if all outcomes are equally likely, Then what you do is what we did on the last example. To find the probability of an event, you take the number of outcomes in your events over the number of outcomes in your sample space. I don't know, maybe that looks complicated. It's really simple though. All it's saying is you take what you're looking for out of the total to find a probability. The last example was like, hey, out of the eight times, how many have at least one coin on heads? Well, it would be seven out of eight. That's all that means. Two more. You have what's called the complement of an event. And the complement of A is A, and you put like a little, it looks like an exponent of C. Um, the complement means everything not in the original. And maybe that's worth writing down if you didn't already know that. So complements, when they talk about that, is everything not in A. So let's say my event A is raining. I want to find the probability it's going to rain tomorrow. The complement would be everything not in A. So everything that's not raining, snowing, foggy, sunny, um, tornado, whatever else, as long as it's not rain, that would be the complement. 
So instead of listing out all that stuff, it's easier just to say not A sometimes. Now let's say tomorrow there's a 20% chance it's gonna rain. Well, the probability it won't rain, so the probability of the complement, if there's a 20% chance it does rain, there's an 80% chance it doesn't, you just do one minus 0.2. So you take one minus your original probability, and that gets you the probability of the complement. If there's a 30% chance something happens, there's a 70% chance it doesn't. That's all that's really saying. And then finally, my last rule, if A and B are mutually exclusive, what does that mean? Mutually exclusive. It means they cannot occur at the same time. So let's say I was going to roll a die. Rolling a two or rolling a three, those are mutually exclusive. My die can't say two and three at the same time. If it's something that cannot occur together, it's called mutually exclusive. And if you want to find the probability of A or B, so the first thing or the second one, this should look a little familiar because we did talk about this in Algebra 2. All you're going to do when they're mutually exclusive is you're just going to add the two separate probabilities together. Kind of did that with you on the last example where I added up the 3 over 8, the 3 over 8, the 1 over 8. If there's overlap, you have to deal with that, but that'll be the next video. So those are our rules for probability. And let's just look at an example to close this video out. So at the time I'm recording this video, this is my full AP data set of scores that kids get on the AP test and the probability associated with those outcomes out of all the kids who have taken the class. And you can see the breakdown here by score, which incidentally should give you guys like make you feel good or motivated that, hey, if I put in the work and I study, I will do well on this test and I will get credit for the class. Um, because we'll cover everything you need. So stick with it, even if it feels like shaky at times, you'll do well if you keep putting in the work. It says to show why this is a legitimate probability model. I didn't explicitly say this earlier, but you need to do two things when you show it's a legitimate probability model. You need to show that all probabilities are valid. And by valid, I mean they're between zero and one. So if you look at these, yes, 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 they're all between zero and one, good. You also need to show that all the probabilities add up to one. So if these don't add up to one, that means that something is missing and it's not a full probability model because it doesn't have everything in the sample space. So they all probabilities add to one, check. So what I would have to do to verify that is I would just add these up and I would make sure that they actually do equal one to make sure I didn't leave anything out, and they do. So that is a good model. Okay, so if I ask you to verify that something's a probability model, make sure there's no like weird negative probabilities or probabilities of like seven, and then also make sure the probabilities add up to what they're supposed to. Then once you've done that, they just ask you for a few basic things here. What's the probability that if you pick a kid at random who's taken my AP class, they've scored a three or better? Well, three or better. These are mutually exclusive. You can't get a three and also get a four. Your score can't be both at the same time. So all I need to do is add up all the ones I care about. Add up the threes, add up this, add up this, and that's going to get you your total probability. So if I do those, and when you write these down, guys, show your work, always show your work, no matter how basic it is, it's going to be 85.5%. So I'm showing that work. So it looks like the probability that if you are you pick a random kid that they pass the AP test, it's going to be about 85%, 85.5%. Okay, so that is just what you do. You add those up. And then for this next one here, it says the probability that if you pick somebody, they did not get a four. So it could be like anything else, but not a four. There are two ways of doing this. One is just add up this, 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 and that will be totally cool. That's everything that's not a four. You can also use that complement rule, which sometimes is easier, and just do one minus 
the one that you do care about or that you don't want or whatever. If you do that, you're going to get a probability of 0.818. So that is how you calculate basic probabilities using a probability model.